Hi, my name is Lander Facchinetti, and let's write some code together, shall we? What we have on the menu is something weird. <laughs> there is this programming language called Racket, and I used to use this programming language. It comes with uh, tools for many things, really, for building graphical user interfaces and whatnot, but I got into Racket back when I was a graduate student in another life, and I used to do research in programming language theory. Racket comes from a programming language theory background, and there is some tools to work with programming languages in Racket. One of these tools is called PLT, uh, PLT Redux. And I used to use this tool a lot, and I wrote an article. I was part of the Racket community. I'm no longer part of the Racket community, not really, but the reasons for that are a story for another day. But I used to be a part of this community. As you can see, there is my face here on the website under community. And this is a new website, so I was quite surprised to see my own face there. But in any case, I wrote this article about PLT Redux that is that was sort of an introduction to what it was and how you could use it. But since then, I had to change the way my website was built in many ways, and I took off that article, so I took it offline. And from time to time, someone asks me, oh, where is that article? I would like to read it. Or I saved it for later, and it's now five years later, <laughs> or like two or three years later, and I would like to read that article, but it's offline. So I thought, wouldn't it be fun to reinstall Racket and give it a try, try to recreate what that, what that article was doing? So I reinstalled Dr. Racket and, and the whole Racket installation. And what we are going to do today, so what we have on the menu today is to use PLT Radex, which is a tool for working with programming languages to implement a game of Peg Solitaire. And that's a board game that you play by yourself. It has very simple rules, but the intent here is that you can learn PLT Radex without having to learn the whole background on programming language theory. And I think that's helpful because when I was learning PLT Redux, I was also trying to learn programming language theory and I would read all these papers that would use this weird notation and PLT Redux tries to mimic that notation, but you can actually run things, which helped me understand both the papers and the notation used in programming language theory, in the field of programming language theory. And... I think it's helpful to learn PLT Redux so you can understand better these papers, but you can also understand better the papers if you implement them in uh, PLT Redux. So it is kind of advantageous for you to do that if you're starting with programming language theory, and there are also reasons for you not to do that, but that's something I will probably talk about in another video. In any case, I reinstalled Dr. Racket after many years without having used it. I don't remember many things, but we'll try to build a game of Peg Solitaire using PLT Redux. So let's get started. The first thing I do remember is that you always have to say hashlang and the language you're using. So the language I'm using is Racket. And that's because Racket is a language, but it's also a family of languages. And you have to specify which language in the family you are using. So I'll say that this is pegsolitaire.racket. And if I run this, the run button is hidden under my face. If I run this, then it should pick up that I'm using the, la the language racket. Okay, so with that, now the first thing I have to do is to require because um, PLT Radex comes with racket. So I don't have to install anything, but I do have to require it. It's not available by default just by saying hashlang racket. So I'll say, I think it's PLT Radex but I don't quite remember it. Oh, probably not. So just Redux. And another thing I should do is open the help. The help is really good in Racket. That's one of the main features of the language. The documentation is excellent. It also looks good, but it's very well written. It was written by people who write papers and whatnot, and they write for a living, so they write very well. Anyway, I can look for Redux and we will have to look at some point at the reference. So let's start there. So require Redux. And now this is something that works 
for programming languages, right? So we are going to pretend that we are doing a programming language that is, in fact, our game of Peg Solitaire. If you don't know the rules of Peg Solitaire, we will get to them in a moment. But it's a board game. So what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a language. But when you say you're defining a language, what we are really doing is defining a data structure that holds the programs in your language. And there is this relationship between data structures and programs, and that goes really deep, especially in languages like Racket that come from um, Lisp ascendants. So th there is this connection, and I'm going to leverage this connection. I'm going to define a new language that is a language within Racket. So I'm working with Racket, but now I'm going to define a language that is embedded in Racket. And that is similar to what you would find with, for instance, regular expressions. They are a language embedded in other languages like Perl, more, most famously, but every program language has a version of uh, regular expressions. And that's what we are going to do here. We are going to define a language within the language. I don't remember exactly how to define a language, but I can look up the documentation really quick here. So yeah, this is kind of weird, but I remember how to read this more or less. So first thing is I have to give the language a name. The, ling the name of the language is going to be Peg Solitaire. And then I'm going to define some non-terminals and I'm not going to use any binding spec. Okay, so the non-terminals. The idea here is that we are defining a grammar for this language. And by defining a grammar, I'm saying what the data structures look like. It's similar to what you would do in, for instance, I guess probably the most popular language that I can talk about um, definitions of data structures is TypeScript, because that's the flavor of language that I think most people are going to know. Anyway, so in TypeScript, I can define a type that is, for instance, bag solitaire is equal to some board with an array of positions or an array of position. And I guess the way you write this is uh, array of position. And then you also have to define the type position that is going to be a string. I'm going to define the strings using Unicode. So I'm going to say that maybe uh, a blank spot like this is a place without a peg and a spot like this is a place with a peg in there. And I probably have, yeah, I have the wrong syntax here. Anyway, so what we are doing here is just defining the types. We are not creating any data structures. We are just saying this is the shape of the data structure that holds a board. And that's what we are doing here. And we are defining this using this weird notation for defining languages. And that's the notation you would find in academic papers as well when working with programming language theory. That's the kind of notation you're going to see. And it is almost a one-to-one -one correspondence to what you would find in papers. Anyway, so I know that I have to put here some non-terminals and they are going to be similar to these things here. So I already have the notion of peg solitaire, so I think I'll just say there is a board. So a board, and I think that's the notation. Um, so a board is going to be a list of lists of positions. And I don't really remember the shape of a peg solitaire board, so I am going to look this up. And apparently there is already an image here, so that's good enough. Okay, so we are going to go with the English version. And I already have here some ASCII art I can copy and paste. And then I can work with that. So as I said, I want the pegs to be represented by these characters. So I'm going to replace these characters with these squares. And I'm going to replace everything accordingly. I'll skip this. Okay, so I skipped over that part, but I replaced everything. I also put some paddings because I want to be able to tell if I am on this position right here. 
And to be able to tell that, I need some some paddings here to, to so that I'm not confused about this being on this row, on this column, I should say. So this being on this column. I don't want to get confused about that, so I put some paddings in there. So that's one of the things that I should mention about Racket. The Unicode support is excellent, and you can use Unicode characters in positions of identifiers. For instance, here, when I say Peg Solitaire, I could say Peg Solitaire and then some emoji or whatever. Um, how do I draw some emoji in Dr. Racket? I don't remember, but let's pick some rocket ship from here and then paste it there. <laughs> and it doesn't show up, but it's valid racket. It just it doesn't know how to render the rocket, but it's valid racket to have Unicode in identifiers and everywhere really. And what we have here are not strings. They are atoms, they are identifiers of sort, but they are definitely not strings. I think that the, the name for that is symbol. That's what they are. They are symbols. They are not strings. They are not the same thing. And that is a definition of a board that is our initial board. I also want the things to be on a list, so I'm going to encapsulate every row with one of these because that makes them the, the rows lists. And I am going to encapsulate the whole thing. So the whole board is going to be a list of lists, like so. And that's a, a representation that is similar to what you would find if you were doing any um, anything with JavaScript or C, you would probably represent this as an array or a list of lists. And then I can close all the parentheses. So that's a definition of a board, but that's one board. That's our initial board. And that is it, really, the initial board. But I want to be able to represent in this data structure any kind of board. When you do some moves in the game, I want to be able to represent them as new boards as well. So. What I'm going to do instead here is going to be, I'm going to define a term. So that's also another thing that you can define with Redex. It's uh, it's coming from Redex. And I'm going to say that the initial board is that. So that's my initial board. But what about all the other boards? Well, I, ne I need to introduce this notion that I wrote here in TypeScript, this notion of positions, and they can be either these two, or they can also be the dot that is representing the padding. So the positions can be anything like that. And I'm going to be loose about the definition of a board here because I could be more strict and define that the paddings need to appear only in these positions. I could do that if I wanted to be more specific, but it's a trade-off. You can be super specific about the definition of the language, then it is kind of harder and more or more awkward to use in some cases, or it can be more loose with the definition of the language. And as long as I follow the rules everywhere, it, it works. And of course, now I'm talking about boards in Peg Solitaire, but this idea translates when working with programming languages as well. There are notions that you want to represent in the definition of the syntax of the language, which is what we are defining now. And then there are notions that you don't necessarily want to represent in the syntax of the language. You just want to ensure that it's in some other way. One of the examples is the notion of variables that are bound or not. For instance, I will show this again in, in TypeScript, but the variable hello is not bound, as you can see here, cannot find name hello. And I could try to do that with PLT Redux by specifying the thing we saw before here when we were looking at the fine language. There is this binding spec that tries to represent this idea of things that are bound or not, but it's kind of complicated to do that in the definition of the language. It's usually better to just define the language as terms can appear in anywhere, in any position, and then you have some additional check that verifies, do you define the variables before trying to use them. So this squiggly red thing would be calculated somewhere else in the code. And this is similar to what would happen, for instance, in a type system. In a type system, you don't do the type checking when looking at the structure of the program. You first capture that structure somehow in the syntax or a syntax tree or something, and then you run a type checker that does the rest of the work. Anyway, so coming back here to our example, I'm going to be loose about the 
definition of positions so that if you don't use the right if you don't use this this structure the right way you could try to represent a board like this which is nonsensical because you can move pegs but you cannot you cannot change the structure of the board itself so this is either going to be a peg or a space but it's never going to be a padding anyway let's do the position thing so a position is one of these three so it's either a space And I'm also, when I'm copying and pasting, I am making sure to select the spaces around the character because you cannot tell this, but when I'm moving my cursor, I'm moving like once, twice, three times. See, on the third time it didn't move. And I guess that's because this is a Unicode character that is represented with more than one byte. And then Dr. Racket is not exactly handling that all that well. But if I put the spaces around, then I'm guaranteed to take the whole character with all their byte with all the bytes in there and i can always and i remember this command i for uh indenting the code and formatting it but it's skipping these spaces which i don't like so i guess i can get rid of them okay so now i have position as something defined as a known terminal or a type not not really a type it's not really a type, but that's, I guess, the best analogy I can make. And I'm sure that if someone in the Racket community uh, watches this and they all know a lot more about programming language theory than I do, and they're going to be all like up and down saying, types, oh, no, 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 you're misguiding everyone. You're completely wrong. I am. I, I probably am about most things. That's how things go. Anyway, so I have one, two, three, four five, six, seven. I have seven positions, so I'm going to now replace this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Did I get it right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And just by hovering over a variable, you can see where it comes from. So you can see that the fine languages, the fine language comes from RedX, and initial board is not used anywhere, not yet. The language peg solitaire is not used anywhere, not yet. But position is used, so it's defined here, and you can cross-reference everything, which is, I guess, probably the best feature in Dr. Racket. I haven't seen anything like that in any other IDE or text editor. Super helpful. Anyway, what I just did here is I replaced specific positions. I had specific positions like this. I replace that with the definition of position. And now the position can be any one of these three. So now I can represent any kind of row. And I can copy and paste that into all these other positions as well. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to explain something else about the definition of a language. Using the fine language or using the notation used in any kind of paper for uh, programming language theory. But also in other things like in the definition of network protocols, you can sort of see this as well. And you, this documentation really is another instance of this. It is something called EBNF. It's a way to define grammars. And it's a notation used in many places. It's helpful to learn how to read this. And there is one quirk that is super curious. Everywhere in your code, when you say something like, uh, hello. So you say cons hello equals hi, and then somewhere else you say hello. These two are the same, right? And that is true of most places in PLT, RedX, and in the notation used in programming language theory as well. When you say the same name, it means the same thing. But here, only in this place I, that I remember, in, BN, in EBNF grammars, only in this place this position may be space, and this position may be a peg. So that's the only place when defining a grammar is the only place when you can say the same name and mean different things. If you want to be specific, you can. When defining this grammar here in PLT Radix, if I remember correctly, you can say something like underscore one. And that, again, is similar to what you would find in papers because you would see a subscript one which would be written in LaTeX with underscore one. 
when you do this, you are now saying that this is not just any position. This underscore is magic in PLT Redux. It means this position is just not just any kind of position. It is position one. It has a name now. And because it has a name, if you see the same name multiple times, then it needs to be exactly the same of these three. And then in this grammar, first two positions would need to be exactly um, the, the, the same. It could be either one of the three, but it needs to be the same in these two for the thing to be defined as a board at all. Anyway, I don't need that now, so I'm going to just continue replacing everything. Missed one. There you go. Okay, so next thing I want to do is to prove that my initial board is a term in this language. It is like a program in this language. So if the language we were defining was TypeScript, then we could say that this is a program in TypeScript. We defined the language TypeScript. This is an example of a program in that language. But our language here is not TypeScript. It is the language of peg solitaire boards. And now I, I here I have an example of a peg solitaire board. So I want to make sure that this term is identified by this language. It is a term in the language. It is a program in the peg solitaire language. And it's kind of weird that I'm doing this, right? I have boards as programs. They are being represented with this data structure, but it should be defining a language. So yeah, my boards are programs in this language, and I'm going to manipulate the program using PLT Redux tools. And when I manipulate that program, it's going to play the game. We are going to be able to play the game. That's the promise. Okay, so let's look in the documentation for something that starts with match. And I see already something here. So I can do a Redux match with language pattern and term expression. So uh, the language is peg solitaire. The pattern I'm looking for is board. This is the pattern here. And the term expression is initial board. And then I get an error. I think that the error here means that I am using this in the wrong context because this is not just any, it's not a variable I defined in record. Can I get rid of this bottom view? I don't remember how to do that. Hide interactions. So this is not a record variable. It is a term in the language or it's a term in PLT Redux. So I think I need to say term for this to work. No errors. Okay. So now I can look at the result of this and, and see if it matches anything at all. And to be able to do that, I guess I need to go back to the interactions view. So I need to show it again. I can run the program. There is a run button here behind my face. There is also a keyboard shortcut command R. It runs the program. It takes a while. Interesting. Okay, but it got a match. So there could be multiple matches. There could be multiple ways to match a program in the language. But there, in this case, so that's why it returns a list. But in this case, there is only one. And the match is binding board, the pattern board, comes from here with the board. This just means it matched. The initial board is a term in the language. I'll give you an example of something that is not a term in the language. For instance, the term hello. When I run that, it returns false. So that hello is not a term in the language, it's not a board. And of course, this is a super naive pattern here that we are using, but we can be a lot more sophisticated with patterns. We are going to see more sophisticated patterns in a minute, I think. So now I have this, I, I want to comment this out. I don't want that to output every time. And what I'm going to do next is to implement the rules of the game. I'm going to, so the rules of the game have to do with how you can move pegs in the board and how they affect other pegs. I'm going to implement the rules of the game as manipulations on the program. And these manipulations in, when working with programming languages, these manipulations could be type checking, executing the program, verifying if the variables are bound, if they are defined before they are used, like we just talked about. They could be uh, program analysis. 
It could be anything that you can do with programs from even simple things like, I guess, uh, counting the number of terms in the language. You could count the number of pegs in the board. All those things are manipulations with programs. And those are the sort of things that you can, that you can do with PLT Redux. So I'm going to define, there are different ways to do this. There are different operations you can run. And from all of these, the one I, I, I want to use is something called a reduction relation. The idea behind a, re a reduction relation is really sophisticated. It is like a case uh, in other languages. So I guess in JavaScript, there is switch case. And I don't know how to write that, but yeah. So Visual Studio Code is going to help me out here. Um, and it's the, the idea behind a reduction relation starts with this. It starts with switch case. So you have some value here, which is going to be our board. And then there are different cases. The case where you can can move to the left, for instance. And I didn't really explain the rules of peg solitaire, but I will in a, in a moment. But just for now, you can take this peg and you can move it left, jumping over this other peg, similar to what you can do in checkers. Anyway, uh, so you have all these cases. And then the first thing that the reduction relation is going to do is take your board and try to match with the first case or try to verify if it is uh, if it matches really I think that's the right word to use here so if the board is matching this case or that case and or in that case and so on and that's how it starts but there is a difference when you are doing a switch case statement in uh, JavaScript or any other programming language, you're going to do the, the switch case in order. So you're going to test the cases in order. And the first one that matches, you execute. And yes, if you don't have a break at the end of the case, it's going to fall through and execute all the following cases. But the point here is it finds a match on the first, it, try, it tries to find a match in order. And the first one that matches executes. So this is going to execute at most one of the cases. And if you have a default, it's going to ex execute exactly one of the cases, as long as you have breaks everywhere. So that's how the reduction relation starts. It starts by doing this matching, but it doesn't run just one of the branches. It runs all that could match. So it's going to test the, the board against can move to the left. It's going to test again, can move to the right. It's going to test again, can move, uh, can move up, it's going to test again, can move down. And if you have a board in which you can do all of this, for instance, in, in the initial board, you can move this peg here to the left, or you can move this peg over here to the right, or you can move this peg down here to uh, this position, can move up, and you can move this peg here down. So in this case, that you can do all four of these operations, then the reduction relation is going to actually do all four of these. And it's going to return, not really return, but it's going to give you a list of all the possible options. So that's how a reduction relation is different from your regular switch case statement. A switch case statement, I think, is a good way to start thinking and reasoning about this, but it's not the end because the reduction relation is going to run all the cases that match. And there is a fancy name for this. And that is the switch case statement is deterministic. It's going to, to run just one of the cases and the, the reduction relation is non-deterministic. It's going to run uh, all the different possibilities. So it kind of forks the universe and tries all the different options and gives you back a list. It's not exactly proper to say that it returns a list, but that's how we are going to observe this in PLT Radix. And that's a good way to reason about this at first. Anyway, so let's see how to define a reduction relation because I don't remember. First, you have to say reduction relation, then the language, which is peg solitaire. Then the domain is a pattern. So it's going to go from boards, 
the domain can be understood as what is the shape of your inputs. So if coming back to here to our analogy with uh, a typed language like TypeScript. So if you're defining a function f, I don't like function f. Uh, if you're defining a function by, then you can have an input called a, which is a number and it returns a string. And of course, this is invalid because it's not returning a string. So I'll make it return a string, which will be a Unicode character for a rocket. Yay, that shows up. So what we are doing here with the main is, is with, we are specifying the kind of the input. And in code domain, in code domain, we are specifying the type of the output. And the domain here is a board. And the code domain is also a board because when making a move, we are going from one board to another. Base arrow, I have no idea what that should be. Base arrow name. Well, that's kind of optional because I see this bar here. So that's optional and I don't know what it's for. So I'm not going to use it. And then reduction case and shortcuts. I don't think I need to use any shortcuts. Yeah, with shortcuts, so I don't need to use that. And reduction case. So we are going to have many of them. That's why there are ellipses here. And each one of the reduction cases is going to be one possible movement in the board. Okay, so let's look at what a reduction case looks like. So arrow name and can I see an example of this? Oh, awesome. So reduction relation, the name of the language, and then a reduction case. So it seems like the arrow can be just this, which seems to come from PLT Radix. And like so. And then I have a pattern of input and a term for the output. I think that's how it reads. And then a name, which in this case is beta v. So my input is going to be a board because that's a valid pattern. It comes from here. And my output is going to be a board. Yes, this is not a rule in Pack Solitaire, but I'm starting things by saying that this is a rule and I'm going to call this rule remove me. So I remember to remove it later. And like so, okay. So this rule is kind of silly. It doesn't change the board at all, but this is just for me to check that I can actually run the reduction relation and it will do something. It will at least not fail completely with an error. And I have a reduction relation, but I think I need to define a variable that I, yeah, I think this returns a, a reduction relation as a value. Let me check. So this is a piece of syntax, but I think it returns a reduction relation as a value that I should then define, so I am going to associate a variable with this reduction relation and it's going to be play. I'm going to call it play because it allows me to play the game. And then I have something to test reduction relations. So I think that I, I have something like apply reduction relation. Yeah, apply reduction relation. It takes a reduction relation and a term and returns a list of terms that the term reduces to. From this name, reduction relation, you can kind of tell that this was initially designed to execute programs. It's going to take your initial program, which is kind of big, and reduce it. So if your initial program is something like, I don't know, something like this, if this is your initial program, it's going to run that by reducing it. So it's going to do something like this, making it smaller and smaller on each step. I think that's where the name comes from, reduction relation. I think that's where it comes from. So I'm going to go back to the documentation, apply reduction relation and paste that here. And my reduction relation is play. And my initial term is the term initial board. I'm going to run this and see if it returns a list containing a board. Yes, it does. It returns a list containing a board and it 
breaks the formatting of the board, but it returns a list containing a board. And that means that this reduction relation ran and executed this part. To double check this, what I'm going to do now is, let's see if this works. I'm going to comment out this whole rule and then it complains that there are no rules. Okay, so I cannot test this out doing this. Maybe I can just come up with a board. How about that? I can come up with a board for the output in which I change the first position over there. So I'm going to change that position to be a space. So I sh should expect to see a space over here after running this. So I start with my initial board and then I run this rule that is going to change that initial peg into a space. So let's run that and hooray, yes, that worked. So it means that I'm now running my reduction relation which has only one case, but it's matching the board and it's good that we put the domain and codomain here because if I wanted to do something else, like instead of uh, a peg or a space or a padding, I could put something like an alpha. Alpha is definitely not a position, so the output is not a board. And I, when I try to run this, I think it will complain that I produce the term. Yeah, the reduction will reduce to something that is not in the codomain. So it's kind of doing the type checking, it's not really a type, uh, but it's at least matching against this pattern and give you an error if it doesn't match. Anyway, so that is a rule that we can use um, to do some transformations. Now let's work with the first rule in the game. I'm going to put board back here. The first rule in the game is you can take a peg, jump over another peg, put it in a space, and then this is going to become a space, right? Because this bag just jumped, and then this one goes away. So it's similar to checkers, or how you can jump over some, I, I don't know, chess. I was going to make an analogy to chess, but I don't know how to play it. Anyway, it is similar, similar to checkers. In effect, what happens is, you take anywhere in the board, not exactly in this position, but anywhere in the board, so after playing a couple times, your board is going to look something else, not like this, but anywhere in the board where you see something like this, then you can transform it into, oh, uh, come on, spaces, all uh, right, I almost got this, oh, this is so painful, okay, anywhere you in the board where you see a pattern like this, you can transform it into a pattern like that, which represents this bag just jumped over to this position, so that's why it's here, and then it's no longer there, so that's why this is a space. And this, which used to be a peg, it was jumped over, so it goes away from the board. So that's one of the moves in peg solitaire. And of course, there are other moves as well, from right to left, to from top down and bottom up. And your goal is to have just one peg at the end. So it's peg solitaire because you play by yourself, it's peg solitaire because there should be one peg at the end. That's the goal of the game. So again, I'm, um, what we are going to do is, uh, the idea that we are going to, to implement here is, I'm going to try to find that pattern that I showed you before in the board, and we are going to replace that pattern with something else. So I don't want necessarily to match in this position, but I guess that's how I'm going to start. So I'm going to start by matching in that position specifically. And I'm going to match the initial board exactly. I'm doing baby steps here. So select that and then remove it. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm really sad that I, I used Unicode characters because I'm having a lot more trouble to actually implement things. Anyway, so if your initial board looks like this, then you can make a move and your next board will look like that. And then I can run this and I should see a board with two spaces, like so. Now we are going to find this pattern, not exactly in this position, but anywhere in the board. The way to do this is we can use any 
as a keyword in PLT Radix to represent anything at all. So I can replace this with any, and I'm going to run this again, and I'm going to have the same output. Any matches anything at all. So now I can say any, and I can say any number of times. So here I have exactly one any, but what if I can have multiple any's? And I don't know how many exactly, because I don't know in which row this pattern is going to occur. So if I don't know how many, I can say any dot dot dot. The space is important here, so any space dot dot dot. That is also going to match, and I can even remove all these other lines. Let's see how that goes. Okay, so it's still matching, it's still getting the output. And the same is true for all these lines, all these rows below. So I can also say any dot dot dot. Oh, that didn't work. And I guess that comes back to the thing I mentioned where if you have multiple any's, I think they need to be the same thing. I was talking about this when I was defining the grammar. So position here, this position can be different from this one, but I don't think that this any can be different from this one. Well, the solution here is simple. I can just put some uh, underscores and then I'm naming the any's, I'm giving them different names so they can be different. Okay, so we are back to a working state. Now, what is cool is that we are matching this any, and this is something that we can use later when building the output. So what I'm going to do is build the output by saying any one dot dot dot. I don't remember if this is going to work. Yeah, it did. So I'm taking some rows here that I don't care about, I don't know their shape, and I'm just saying, okay, whatever those rows were, copy them over here to the output. And of course, I want to do the same thing with any two as well. Okay, and here, when this row of interest, it doesn't really matter if I have this pattern, the pattern I'm looking for is this. It doesn't really matter if it occurs here or if it occurs to the right or to the left. As long as this pattern occurs, then it's okay. So what I'm going to say is again, for anything before the pattern, so for anything before, I'll say any three because it's different from one and two. And for anything after, I'm going to say any Four. And I need the dot 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 because this any is now matching position. So these any's one and two were matching rows, entire rows. Here any is matching one position, and I want mul potentially multiple of them. And I have to copy over any three and four in the output as well. So I'm replacing that, and I'm replacing this part. And when I save that, run it again, I should see the same board, and I do. Huh, awesome. So we implemented one of the rules of peg solitaire, the rule that allows you to move a peg to the right. Now this is no longer remove me, this is move to the right. Or because I can have Unicode, I'm going to put an, arrows, an arrow here. Maybe it could be confused with this arrow, I don't know. But I will give it the name. Uh, an arrow. Unicode is fun stuff. And I can, in Dr. Racket, I can type the LaTeX for something like, um, I don't know, uh, V dash. It's a character that you, that you use in programming language theory a whole lot. And then you can hit control and backslash and it transforms into the Unicode for that character. So if you know LaTeX, then you can write fancy code with Unicode that looks like what you would see on a paper. Anyway, so I have um, one of the rules that allows me to move a peg to the right, and I guess it wouldn't be hard to implement the 
converse, that is the rule that allows me to move a peg to the left. Because another rule of peg solitaire is that if you have a peg over here, or I can show this on the initial board, if you have a peg over here, then you can jump to the left over this peg to this position, to occupy this position, and then this position that is selected becomes a peg, and these two positions are uh, become spaces. So I just have to match this pattern and it will produce this output. Now remember, oh, I need to change this to left arrow. And remember that the reduction relation is not going to just run the first of these that match, it's going to run all that match. And in the initial board, both match. So I can run this and it will produce now two boards or it should have produced two boards, uh, one that was a move from left to right and one that was a move from right to left. But it didn't produce two boards and I have no idea why. So let's try to figure it out. Okay, so I got this to work by copying and pasting these characters again. I'm pretty sure that when copying and pasting this multi-character, multi-byte characters, I just copied one of the bytes and then it wouldn't match. Anyway, now I'm I have two lists that I have a list of two boards, one with a move uh, from right to left, so you are left with these two spaces, and one with a move from left to right, so you are left with two spaces over here. Okay, so th those are the rules that do from left to right and from right to left. Now we have to do moves from bottom up and from top down, because you can also move this peg over here, over that one, and end up with a peg over here and two spaces here and there. Now, to implement this, I'm going to copy one of these. I'm going to rename it. So we're going to do top down first. So it's going to be a bottom or down arrow. I don't remember my LaTeX anymore. Down arrow. And this time we are not looking at one row. We are looking at three rows. We are looking at for instance, in this case, we are looking at this, this, and this, all three of them. So now we have one, two, three rows that we are looking at, and we are looking for a pattern. I'll try to be very careful about the way I'm deleting these things. So we'll have a pattern that looks like, I'm waiting to say this. <laughs> we have a pattern that looks like the thing I have here, there. And through the magic of editing, we are done with that. We deleted everything. So we are looking for a pattern that looks like this, and we want to produce a pattern that looks like that. Okay, magic of editing one more time. So we are looking for a pattern that looks like this, and we want to produce a pattern that looks like that. We still don't care about if uh, there are rows before or after, so we are going to leave any one and any two in place. And we don't care about the things on the left and on the right, so we are going to just renumber this, so three, four, five. I had to use um, the magic of editing one more time, and I wish I could just say, oh, it's going to turn into that, but then I had a bunch of mistakes when I spliced that character that was a multi-byte character. It went all over the place, and I had parts of characters here after the ellipses. It was just a whole mess. But I think I cleaned everything up. I think I did. If we run into weird errors, I'm going to blame the Unicode characters and try to clean everything again. Anyway, so now we have these patterns, and they're matching these three roles with the three positions we care about and replacing accordingly. But there is an issue. The number of elements, the number of positions in any three, five, and seven may not necessarily be the same. So you could be matching this, this, and that, misaligning the three uh, positions in different roles, in different columns. But there is a trick that we can use in PLT Redux to fix this, and it's probably one of my favorite tricks in PLT Redux, which is the trick of having names for underscores. And if you name the underscores the same name, 
For instance, I'm going to name them nine because that's the next number. So if you give the same number, then it doesn't mean that we want exactly the same elements because we have any three, five, and seven. They are different names, so they can be different positions. But the number here means we want exactly the same amount of them. And this has the effect of aligning the columns of these three elements. So now that match that I was talking about is no longer valid because this ellipsis and this ellipsis would not match that ellipsis, the ellipsis that come before the elements I highlighted. That's another reason to have the paddings because it makes this rule very natural to write. So with that, I will save and run this and I expect to see three different boards. And I only see two of them. So now I'm going to do some Unicode cleaning up here. Yep, cleaning up the Unicode solved the problem. I'm starting to regret having used Unicode, but I think it's fun to look at the boards that way. And now we run and we see three different boards. The first, the, the second is doing the move to the left. The third is doing the move to the right. The first is doing a move uh, from top to down. Now we are going to do the converse of this for the other one as well, from going from bottom up. I'm going to use the magic of editing one more time. Oh, I wish the real life had this. Anyway, I have four rules now. I have the up rule as well. It's the converse of the previous one. It's still using the underscore identifier for the, um, the ellipses so that they are aligned. And now I have four outputs and this one is doing the uh, the down arrow, so the one we looked at before, and this one is doing the new one. So you have now two spaces at the bottom, and then the peg is, fill it, is filling in this space over here. And with that, we have implemented all the four rules of how you can move a peg in peg solitaire. And we have implemented it in them in such a generic way that you can move, you can make these moves anywhere in the board. So Yes, we are looking at the initial board here when we are applying our reduction rule. So we only see four outputs because there, there are only four moves you can make. But if you had more spaces on the board, then you could see more of these outputs. I guess I can quickly come here and grab one of these. For instance, this one, why not? So that's a valid board and I can duplicate this line take that board and now my term is that board and when I play it then I should see more than just four outputs yes um, well maybe less than four outputs I see three of them but it's doing the moves all over the board so it's doing moves uh, I guess down because I should be able to do a move no not down oh yes down from this to here and it, there is no move now there is a move up available and a move from left to right available but there is no other moves besides that so I guess I can just come here with one more space so suppose your board looks like this then there are at least four moves uh, from bottom here and there up here and there and then left so five moves in total I should see five outputs for this application of the reduction relation so I see one two, three, four, five. Excellent. Now, it seems like we are far away from having a way to play the game, but we are not. So I'm commenting out this, and this is a special commenting record that comments the whole expression. Uh, I could use something similar here, and I guess I will, because I think it looks better syntax highlighted like that. Anyway, so... Uh, now we should be able to use the visualization tools in PLT Redex to play the game. And that's the real fun part. In particular, we are going to use this guy. It's called traces. So we are going to call traces with the reduction expression uh, with the reduction and an expression. So we are going to call traces with the play reduction and the expression that is this, the initial board. You can see that often I am double clicking the open parenthesis of something and that highlights the whole expression. Isn't that fun? Uh, that's super helpful in Dr. Racket. Anyway, so traces play the initial board 
And when I run this, Dr. Rector presents me with this view. And with this view, I can see all the possible moves. So from the initial board, I can see all the four moves and I can see which relation was used. And because the relations are arrows and the arrows are aligned with these arrows, it kind of is hard to read. But anyway, I can go along and, and sort of play the game by looking at the traces. So if I want to make a move from bottom up, then I know that I need to follow this. And if I need to go uh, maybe from uh, left to right, then I should follow this arrow and so on. And if there is something that I want to explore more, I can click on it and click on reduce. And it's going to produce a bunch more of these. Oh, it's going to produce for all of them, not just for the one I selected. So it's going to produce a lot of these possibilities. And already with four moves, it's kind of hard to navigate. It's still producing more of them. So maybe if I close this, <laughs> I cannot close this. Okay, this, so this is going to take a while. I'm going to use the magic again. <laughs> okay, I got back to our working stage. There is a button here for stopping Dr. Racket that works most of the time. It's pretty good. Anyway, uh, it's, it stops the program you're running in Dr. Racket. It doesn't stop Dr. Racket. So it stopped the program that was expanding all the possibilities. And then I got uh, working state again. So I, I'm going to comment out this version. And there is another visualization tool, super helpful for working with programming languages. And it is the stepper. So again, I need to pass the reduction. And I think I can just pass it like this. I think I can do the same thing I did with traces, this time with stepper. Awesome, it worked. So now I have this other view and it did not expand everything right off the gate, but I can click on stuff and do a single step on the thing I want and I can still see that graph. So I can sort of play the game. So if I want to make a move, um, maybe from this back down, I can select this version and then I, ex I can expand it more. There is an arrow behind my face that it can expand. And then I, I can select, so maybe this time I want to move from left to right with this bag, so I can click here and expand that. And then it even shows me the thing that changed, isn't that great? And I can expand that and I have a bunch more possibilities and I can expand one of those. And now I'm playing the game of bag solitaire with PLT Radix. Awesome. Okay, so that was fun and I hoped you liked it too. PLT Radex is a tool for much more than playing games. In essence, it is a functional programming language with great pattern matching and uh, some non-deterministic computation uh, features embedded. And you can use that for modeling languages. You can use that for other places where you would like to have non-deterministic computation. There are limitations, of course. It's not the fastest thing. And you can see that I kind of uh, had issues with Dr. Racket because I was trying to expand too many terms. And of course, there was also the GUI, but um, there are many more things that you can explore in PLT Radix. You can typeset papers, you can create figures for papers using PLT Radix. So you can translate your program that executes your language or your model and turn that into a paper. So there are no typos there because it was generated by the computer. You can also visualize things as I showed you, and it, you can use that when exploring language features or a type checker or whatnot. And you can even generate tests for your language. It can produce language terms, or which would be in our case boards, but in a programming language, it could produce programs or it could produce types. And you can generate those, a lot of those, um, randomly and automatically to test something. Maybe you have a theorem about your programming language and you can just generate a bunch of programs and check that your pro uh, that your theorem holds before you even try to prove the theorem, which is great because many times you think you have a theorem, but you do not. So it's helpful to actually check before you try to prove stuff. Anyway, there is a whole lot more you can learn about PLT Radix. Lots of features for working with bindings, for working with things that are not reduction relations, like meta functions. 
there is a whole lot more and it is helpful to learn PLT Redux if you want to learn about programming language theory because you can implement stuff really easily and also you can get used to the syntax. I think it's helpful to write games or other place, playful things like the one we built today just to learn how the syntax works and to get yourself acquainted with the whole mechanism of working with the stepper and the tracer and whatnot. But I think this should be a good start and I hope you had fun. Thanks for watching this. I see you on the next one. And if you are interested in programming, in other things about video production and whatnot, subscribe to the channel because I have more videos coming up. Anyway, I see you around. Bye.